Welcome to Seven Figure Small, the podcast that brings you the stories and strategies that are driving the growing number of solo businesses achieving seven figures in revenue without investors or employees. If you want to discover what's behind the rise in these seven figure businesses, then you need to get our free Next Level 7 audio course. In this enlightening course from unemployable founder Brian Clark, you'll hear what's working right now for attracting an audience, discovering what they want to buy, and building your perfect business. To sign up for free, go to nextlevel7.com. That's nextlevel7.com. And now, here is your host for this edition of Seven Figure Small, serial digital entrepreneur, Brian Clark. Brian, have you ever heard of the Spring Football League? Spring Football League. The, the Spring no. League, yes. I'm not I'm not surprised. It's not a it's not a particularly popular league. Uh not even on the level of like an XFL or the AAF, which you may have heard of last year. Um but the reason why I bring it up is my dad was over this weekend and my dad is he was born in nineteen fifty four. So whatever, however old that makes him now. Um but he's been you know, kind of basically semi-retired for about the last six months, playing golf and hanging out with his granddaughters and loving life. And he got a call from the Spring League, and they needed a coach to coach the defensive backs. And I think before they could even get the words out of their mouth, he was saying yes, ready to go. He's not getting paid very much, but he's go he's going down to Houston for six weeks, or yeah, six weeks. You know, won't be able to come home, staying down there. He's going to be a coach in the Spring Football League. And I was thinking about this as we were kind of planning this episode about, you know, he's, my dad is just, he's a football guy, man. He coached football. He was a scout. It's just what he does. And any opportunity he can do or he can take to coach or to do it, he's going to take it because it like gives him his purpose, gives him, you know, it's like what gets him up in the morning. So no, there's no level of comfort in retirement that he could have that would that would beat out driving down to Houston to stay in a hotel and coach for a football league that no one really knows about. That's basically just a way to kind of help guys get a second chance at the NFL. Um, and it's, uh, I was thinking about that this morning as we were planning for this episode. Yeah. He's like the, uh, unretirement version of Ted Lasso. I <laughs> <Yeah>. guess. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which by the way, and season he... two is coming out soon. <laughs> I know I'm excited. <laughs> I've never been so excited for such an earnest, sweet show in my life but it was the perfect <laughs> show for its time it was but so yeah, great it is awesome it was so, so great. yeah that's interesting um your dad is not by any means weird um a lot of people just really don't find retirement to be all it's you know cracked up to be like we we had this weird three stages of life myth where you go to school and then you work and then you retire. And that that third part's your your reward. And what you get for that is basically a lack of purpose mm -hmm. and a quicker death. Yeah. So congratulations. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> congratulations. So so let's talk about this. Let's talk about unretirement. Again, you know, this is one of those concepts that you've talked about some over on further. And I think now is a good time to to bring it over here for the unemployable folks. So uh, Maybe let's just start at the beginning. Like, what is unretirement? How do we define that? Yeah. So it may be like there may be some younger people going, oh, I'm tuning out right now. No, trust me, stick with us because this is applicable to you. And that's what's so fascinating to me about the entire concept of unretirement. So it started like with people like your dad. You know, they're basically retired, they've done their, put in their time. And, uh, and then they get bored and they go back to work. So this was the genesis of this term, which I think dates back maybe 10 years or so. But yeah, it started with, um, I guess, older baby boomers who were just, they retired. They have plenty of money, unlike the rest of the generations. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't that they couldn't afford to retire. It was just that they found it unsatisfying. And uh, you can only play so much golf or what have you. So they went back to work, uh, often starting small businesses, right? Because, you know, they don't necessarily want to go back to the corporate job, uh, of the, although, of course, some do in, in some capacity. But 
Yeah, that's that's really the where this term started, but then it shifted to where it became a planning mechanism for those in their late 50s, early 60s. They had no intention of just hitting the golf course or, you know, taking up watercolors like George W. Uh, they were just basically like, okay, I'm going to quit this job I've been at for however long. And now I'm going to start that business I always wanted to start. Uh, I'm going to, you know, join a nonprofit. I'm going to do a combination of both. You know, it's all, it's very centered on what's meaningful and what gives people purpose. Um, because a lot of times you stick with that job to get you across the finish line because really from like age 50 until you retire are the crucial years for retirement savings, even though hopefully you start early and all that kind of stuff. But if you lose your job in your 50s, you're kind of screwed because it's very difficult to get another job. And, um, and uh, you know, that's the years you're, you're really adding up to the nest egg you need to be able to retire at all. So this concept to me uh, started to get interesting, and that's what we started exploring it further, you know, which is for people in their 40s and 50s, so younger uh, than what you would normally think. But now the concept, you know, in my mind uh, is more about this is ridiculous narrative that we bought into that we work, you know, from the time we get out of school until the age of 65, often hating what we're doing so that we can retire and hate retirement, right? If we have the money to get there in the first place. And, and that's another issue. Um, with longer lifespans and uh, way behind on retirement spending uh, savings, uh, Gen X is way behind. Millennials are really in a in bad shape, but at least they have a little bit more time. <clears throat> but but again, even if you have the money, is this what we want? And um, so I was kind of advocating that isn't it smarter to plan to start living the life you want now? you know, take a few years, put it in motion rather than trying to earn enough money in the next 15, 20 years to live for 20 or 30 years without working and not really being fulfilled with it. So um, that's kind of the evolution of, of my use of the term unretirement. And it was interesting to me because, you know, James Clear, uh, author of Atomic Habits, great guy, um, you know, he, he's 33 or something like that. Jeez. And he, he tweeted something to the effect of, you know, why not just start planning to live the life you want now instead of trying to save up for retirement? And, you know, and I was like, hello, I just said that. <laughs> but it was interesting to me to see a 33-year-old say that. Um, and that. And that's really highly motivating to me that – Everything we want to do in retirement, whatever it is, you know, uh, not go to the office, um, travel, um, live anywhere you want. All of these things we think of as retirement fantasies, and, and frankly, they are kind of fantasies because, again, most people get to retirement and they are so afraid of running out of money, basically outliving their money, again, with longer lifespans, that they live really boring, just kind of lame lives, you know, the flip side of it is, okay, you keep working because you can't afford to retire or you don't want to stop working and you're working into your seventies. Okay. You better like what you do at that point. Right? So uh, this is the thing that really crushes me to think of someone who's been working in a job or whatever, hating it. And then they're, they're 55 and think of 20 more years of doing that. If you can, because ageism exi exists, right? And, you know, we're, we're looking at this technological evolution where AI and automation are, may well reduce the number of jobs needed. So who do you think they're going to go with? They're going to go with the cheaper, so-called tech-savvy Zoomers and young millennials. That's kind of a fallacy, but that's what historically we've seen happen. So we have people I you know of all ages are really in kind of a precarious position. So we've been talking about 
the personal enterprise and what have you. Um, and I just see this as an additional motivation that retirement is the wrong goalpost. Um, it should be how soon can I start living the way I want to live and then start executing on that plan. Doesn't this require us to view work in a different way than we have viewed work before? Because a lot of times, like we think about, you know, it's like you go to college, you're going to get a job, you're saving up, and as you said, you know, you're working until a certain age so that you can retire. And so, work is always a vehicle to get X amount of money and get you to this kind of dream retirement stage. But what you're suggesting is something a little bit different, where work is something that's fulfilling because of what it is, not a means to an end but a means that we actually enjoy and that gives us purpose in and of itself. Yeah, that's interesting because I think you're right in that characterization of, of how people think that work is to get to this point. You know, you basically squandered the best years of your life so that you can do some something when you're older. Um, but it doesn't matter. You know, uh, it's already established that, not only does work give us purpose and meaning in, in many aspects, in, in a big chunk of our lives, but it's our identity. Now, it's a totally different question whether that's healthy. And you often see people saying, you know, uh, work is not who you are and, you know, you're more than what you do, et cetera. And I think that's healthy, but it's not reality. I mean, mm -hmm. we do define ourselves by our work. I do see that the people who are uh, self-employed in some capacity, uh, freelancers, entrepreneurs who are really into what they do, I find that identity to be healthy. And they also have, I think, more capacity to have a more well-rounded life because they don't have someone else telling them what to do, when to work, how much, it's really up to you. Now, workaholism exists at all levels, um, but you could be a workaholic in a corporate job or as an entrepreneur. That's It's really a separate issue. So um, yeah. whether you're this hard-charging entrepreneur or more of a lifestyle person, that's your choice. And to me, that's what's important, uh, not someone else making a choice for you. So I have no, you know, my work is a big part of who I am. It's certainly not all who I am. And, and as time has gone by, I really do feel like I'm getting more of a balance. But that's because it was up to me and I got to make those decisions. And that's how it should be, right? The freedom of choice rather than being subjected to the will of another person. Oh, I, I know, I know, I am... I name this unemployable for a reason. Maybe my feelings are stronger than most, but I don't know. There's a lot of unemployable people out there, or at least those who wish they were. Mm -hmm. Gosh, there's something there's something almost sad to me about the thought of not at least taking some of your identity from what you do for work. I mean, I, I get it. You need a balance. You know, it, it can't override your family and those kinds of things. But I like I can't really fathom personally, and I'm guessing there's you know, our audience probably selects for this also. I can't really fathom not not seeing myself in the work that I do. Now, part of that is I love the work that I do and I feel, you know, I've been able to choose those projects and feel really personally invested in them. But yeah, you want to balance. But I would think if you're if you're working at a job and, and you don't take any of your identity from that or don't see yourself at all in that work, and I would I would run in the other direction if I could. That just that doesn't seem like something I would be interested in doing. Yeah, and you know, take this into account that if you're not in charge of the various, you know, the personal enterprise approach looks at work as a series of projects, right? They're usually related because you have specialized expertise. Uh, hopefully, you have an audience, so you have to stay within. Uh, what's relevant to them. But now we're looking at the fact that, again, people are probably going to have to work into their 70s going forward, most people, right? And it's not going to necessarily be the career you've had the entire time. We're going to be looking at this decade, especially reskilling, 
career changes, role changes, because a certain, you know, AI and automation will no doubt eliminate certain tasks and certain jobs. So it's going to require adaptability and, and shifting. Now, again, are you in control of what your next quote unquote project is because you run the personal enterprise type mindset? Or are you going to be forced out of desperation into a new role? Again, what sounds more attractive? So the whole idea of job security has been a joke since I got out of law school. The 90s, remember, it was the downsizing decade where that was really the first effects of digital technology were making themselves known in the workplace. There was all these layoffs uh, I don't know if you remember this, Jared, but there were, it was called the jobless recovery. Mm. There was a recession yeah. at the beginning of the 90s, and then it ended, but the jobs didn't come back. Now, luckily, the internet boom happened. And, you know, this has always been the saving grace, which is why economists like to say that, well, we've never had technology just wipe out jobs. There'll be new jobs. And technologists, people who really understand what's coming in AI and automation, they're like, no, <laughs> this isn't the same as the spinning Jenny. You know, I mean, yeah, like the number of jobs the original spreadsheet uh, eliminated was something like 400 million, but that's just a task, right? And then people were able to, to focus more on other aspects of the financial world. Now we have algorithms that choose your entire investment portfolio. Where exactly do the people go? <laughs> yeah. You know, from there, well, these are fundamentally different levels of technology. And if you ever get to general artificial intelligence, we may not have jobs or us at all because we'll just be batteries for the matrix. <laughs> you know, and I want to underscore something that you kind of alluded to there, which is these aren't trends that you can wish away. Like this is happening, you know, and P and, and one of the big drivers for this unretirement <clears throat> concept is that, you know, society is just getting older. People are living longer and people are living or are, are able to be more active and productive longer. And so, you know, and those people who are living longer and more productive, they want to do something with their time. So, and that's where, you know, planning for this becomes so important because this trend isn't going to stop. and how do we handle a society that is getting older, has more productive capacity, and yet, you know, there may not even be as many jobs for those people? Yeah, it's like a double or triple whammy here because, you know, by 2030, um, I think, uh, the, yeah, the, the largest market of people demographically will be people over 65, Right. And also by 2030, the average 70-year-old will be like today's average 50-year-old. So it's not just that we're living longer. We're also living better yeah. as we, we're aging better, right? And this is a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs, uh, me included, to be looking at serving older people well. Because historically, oh my gosh, it's been a disaster. It's like, you know, it's I've fallen in and I can't get up, condescending crap. Yeah. When most older people are not helpless, feeble, or otherwise, and they don't like being treated like an other just because they're older. And the baby boomers have really led the charge on this, but Gen X will totally change that dynamic. I mean, do you really think we're going to let someone talk to us that way? No. It's just not going to happen. But then again, it, hopefully it'll be Gen X entrepreneurs who you know are the ones who see the opportunity here, so they can they can be relatable and speak to these people. But and, and there's just so you've got Brian. I mean, you know, when as you said, like people are healthier longer. You know, it's like people, you know, someone who's seventy is going to be like the average fifty year old. There's advancements in nutrition. There's all kinds of advancements that are letting people seem younger, even though they're an older age right now. Yeah, and and this does not even take into account the billions being spent on longevity uh, science right now. So forget the miracle pill that, you know, cause they're basically saying, well, aging is a disease and this is a new way of looking at it. The diseases of aging are what kill you. 
not necessarily your chronological age at all. So if you can attack the causes of those uh, diseases of aging, they go away. Uh, then you've really got something. You're, you're looking at lifespans of 100, 110, 120 on, on normal. You know, that, that's crazy. Here's the other aspect of it, though. The birth rate is dropping incredibly. So, you know, for decades, we've been worried about overpopulation. It's going in the other direction. So not only do you have older people being the dominant social group and living even longer, you've got no babies to replace people um, at the at the younger end of things. And then mix with that technology, and you've got like this perfect storm where, you know, obviously, I think in in the uh this decade we need to take charge of our own destinies. But you know, 20, 30 years from now, you're gonna have to see major social change or it, it's game over because it's not gonna run like it does now. But that's really beyond the scope of what we're talking about here today, because the transitional periods before you have true social change, where you restructure society, you know, even through industrial revolutions and whatnot, it's the decades before everyone goes, oh, we have to change things for the better that are the most chaotic. So it's really, what are we going to do now in the near future? as opposed to, um, you know, way down the line. But I see this, again, if if you're willing to see reality and take the steps necessary to do that, forget retirement. You can create a business that allows you to travel, live anywhere you want, all of that great digital nomad stuff that is becoming more mainstream now. And also... As technology advances, as AI and automation is able to handle more and more tasks, you don't need employees and you don't have to do that repetitive mundane stuff because Siri will do it for you or, you know, the B2B version of Siri that, <laughs> that'll be doing your stuff. So if you're in a corporation and they eliminate tasks and jobs, you're out of luck. If you're an entrepreneur who can replace him or herself, with technology, you've got a great life, right? As mm-hmm. long as you're still able to serve your customers. So um, unretirement to me is what I'm doing in two years. I'm going to keep working. Everything I've been working on for the last couple of years and, and the next couple of years is setting the stage for my go forward personal enterprise. I'll work, I'll maintain my sense of purpose but I guarantee you that in the afternoons, I'm going to be surfing or hiking or whatever, right? I'm not busting my ass 12 hours a day anymore. Um, but I don't want to stop working. You know, I, I just don't want to. I like this. I enjoy having a sense of purpose and, and helping people and, and also continuing to have multiple income streams that take me into my 70s as opposed to going, oh boy, I'm going to run out of money. I better just stay in my little house and do nothing as a stereotypical old person. I mean, that also just makes me, honestly, Jared, I I don't think I'd want to be alive if that were my life. You know, Mm -hmm. what's the point? Yeah. That's why you find partners that are like 10, 12 years younger. You know? Oh, you notice this trend. <laughs> I, all my partners are younger than me. So, Even Johnny is 10 years younger than me. You know, I got to I got to get youth on my side. So what you're saying is we got we got to get our texts and emails in in the morning. If we're going to get them answered. Otherwise, we're waiting until the next day. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on. I know. I know. But no, you know, that's an interesting point because, you know, it's interesting to, to kind of try to think about the net effect of technology. Because obviously, you know, technology is having a big impact on people who, you know, are, are reaching retirement age because their jobs are, you know, being downsized or whatever. And it's, it's hurting them maybe with the jobs that they had. But it's also making, as you said, if you can take on your own clients, if you can build your own thing, it's enabling. Technology is enabling people to do that and have these avenues for unretirement that weren't even there a decade ago or two decades ago. You know, and you mentioned the digital nomad thing. 
And, you know, a lot of digital nomads are, you know, are probably older than most people would assume that they are because it, it requires it requires some money and, and it requires you to be kind of established in what you're doing to actually be able to pull it off. So, you know, the net effect of technology, if you're smart and savvy about it, can be a positive for you. Yeah, it, it's interesting because I, I think digital nomad, the stereotype is, you know, a young 20 something with a backpack and that, those people exist. but the kind of people I'm talking about, the average age is 38 and going up. And here's a staggering stat, 1.5 billion digital nomads by 2035. Now, this is a whole confluence of factors, including the ones we've already talked about, but also the diminishing power of nation states. I mean, look around. It's weird to think about that because you see such intense nationalism, but the nationalism is coming from those who don't have the capability to leave, right? Mm -hmm. So, and they're going to be the only ones really left. I mean, whether you want to talk about Brexit, you want to talk about the United States, it's, you know, the people who can leave are going to, for the most part. And 2020 saw a ton of that. Now, historically, this whole idea of the sovereign individual and whatnot has been kind of a libertarian uh, conservative concept, and, and it's always sold by the Marxists are coming this year. No, this time, really, it didn't happen eight years <laughs> of Obama. That Obama was going to do, he's going to take your guns, he's going to lock you in a camp, you know, he's going to tax you into oblivion. None of that happened, and no, no one apologized. <laughs> They're just like, <laughs> Biden, the most centrist <laughs> president we've ever had. He's the guy, he's going to do it. Anyway, but no, most of the people who've been leaving are not necessarily libertarian or conservative. It's more on the progressive side. We talked about before how Mm -hmm. like prepping used to be a a right wing thing. And now it's a progressive thing because of the Trump years. People are like, oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) Things are great. Things can go wrong. Um, So it's really it's I guess if you're patriotic it's sad um but all the most capable people are going to be more citizens of the world that's the trend that's how you get to that 1.5 billion people and i think a lot of those people will come from the united states last year and further i wrote about and, and this wasn't my opinion or it wasn't an opinion piece it was about um people who study the fall of of civilizations and nations Uh, are predicting either really just bad things for the United States this decade and perhaps collapse. And that doesn't, that just blows people's mind because you can't imagine that happening, but look around, you know, since I wrote that piece, we had the Capitol insurrection. We've had more mass shootings than I can count, including in my own home base of Boulder. I mean, The political division is insane. So I don't know. I don't want to get too far down that rabbit hole. That's a personal thing. You know, I I am looking forward to traveling the world because that seven months I did that was the happiest time of my life, honestly. Um, But the other side of it is I don't want to be stuck in any one country. If things go wrong, I want to go somewhere else. And right now, I don't think a lot of people are prepared for that, but the personal enterprise business model allows you to put yourself in a position where, you know, if if things go badly, then you go somewhere else. And that to me is the ultimate freedom, you know, not just not having a boss, not just not having to live in any one particular place. It's more like if things go sideways, I'm in a better position than the average person. And I don't know, maybe that's delusion or paranoid. I don't think so though. I mean, I think it's, I think it's legit and uh, it's nice to have that. That's what I, I, I like to think about. Even if the world corrects itself into some perfect utopia, you know, okay, great. That's good. Odds are it's not going to, so you're going to be prepared for whatever happens. Yeah. Well, and that really, and that's a good way to end this episode, I think, is to tie tie it all together with our last few episodes. You know, you introduced 
the idea of the personal enterprise. We brought Brian Gardner on, you know, talked about what he's built. We brought Laura Roeder on, you know, talked about what she's built. And that's, you know, really the through line between the three of you, you know, different industries, different things that you've done. But you guys have basically put this unretirement idea into action already in your lives. And the personal enterprise is kind of the answer for how you do that. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Laura moved to England, right? Yeah. Uh, also, Brennan Dunn of uh, Right Message and um, what, what's his freelance site? Uh, it's, he it, he doesn't talk about it anymore since he started oh, yeah. Right Message. I don't but, remember the name of it. Yeah, but it's basically you know get more clients. Um, he moved to England. You know, it's double just, your freelancing. That's what it is. Double your freelancing. That's right. Um, you know, there just it seems like more and more people are making significant changes from the status quo. And we keep hearing that coming out of the pandemic, something like 45% of all people are planning to make major life changes because whether it's a near death experience, which I've had or a life altering experience like the pandemic, it really made people go, what am I doing here? Right? This, this is not a dress rehearsal. And all of a sudden, I found myself kind of stuck by forces outside of my control. And I think that's really what matters. You know, we've got a lot of uncertainty uh, with technology, uh, global politics, climate change. It's, It's rough, you know, but the more actual sense of control you have over your life, the more well-being you have. So you can't control what happens with the climate or world politics, but you can control by starting to plan and implement your work and where you live and how you travel instead of some fantasy that you're going to have this ideal life after 65 and not work anymore. It, It doesn't exist, you know, so. And if it did, it probably wouldn't make you happy. So. You know, I think that's the thing. That's why it doesn't make us happy. <laughs> um, either it, it, unless you're truly independently wealthy and you can do whatever you want and not have to work. But even, you know, it's interesting. You hear about uh, the d- despair and depression of the idle rich, mm-hmm. right? They have everything except purpose and yeah. meaning, which is the most important thing. So, ironic. Brian, for someone who's listened to this episode and very interested in what we've been talking about and ready to take some action, what's the next step that they should take right now? Well, stay tuned. Um, Next week, I'm going, hopefully, to have uh, a personal enterprise email course ready to go. A lot. And I started, you know, putting this together uh, because the concept resonated with people so much. And I started writing and writing and writing, and it was thousands and thousands of words. And I'm like, okay, this is not an article. This is bigger than that. Um, But one aspect of it is this whole, you know, work from anywhere, live anywhere. Uh, There's a whole world, no no pun intended, of (laughs) interesting, beneficial aspects of not necessarily being tied to one country. You know, everything from tax breaks to different entities, uh, residencies, second passports. I find all this stuff fascinating, and it's been mm-hmm. you know, part of what I've paid attention to for the last couple of years because I'm trying to set up my own you know, uh, perpetual business trip is what I call it. That's where you keep moving, keep working, keep going. Very nice. So, in other words, make sure that you're signed up for the Unemployable Newsletter, because we will certainly let people know when that's ready on the Unemployable Newsletter, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And um, next week, um, I'll do a short little episode that will give them a direct link as well, uh, where they can sign up. So, yeah, stay tuned. And we're not done yet, because we're going to go right back after that with another uh, personal enterprise case study with Paul Jarvis. I call this one the burn down everything you did to get you here. Once you get to the thing that means the most to you. 
And, and, you know, I, I love that because, you know, we talk about the personal enterprise and people are like, well, do I have to keep taking clients and do I have to keep, you know, with my online courses and Laura Roeder was a great example of, no, she doesn't do any of that stuff anymore. I haven't taken clients since I ditched that last business in 2005 and started copy blogger. Mm-hmm. Um, so not necessarily. And, and on the other hand, I know people who have, uh, you know, online courses and virtual communities who still do freelancing because they love it. I mean, that's the thing. What yeah. do you want? Don't let me tell you what to do. I'll just try to help you, you know, get it going. What do you want? Good question to ponder as we end this episode. All right. Make sure that you are on the unemployable email list, which you can get on by going to unemployable.com. And we will talk to you guys next week. 